Welcome to Witch Hunt, the podcast that investigates the mysteries of the witch trials. I'm Josh Hutchinson. And I'm Sarah Jack. We are both descendants of persons accused of witchcraft in New England. Heck, we're both descendants of people in this episode. And we, and Mary Louise Bingham, are all cousins through our common ancestor, Mary Esty, who was executed for witchcraft in Salem in 1692. In this episode, we are discussing Massachusetts witch trials before the Salem witch hunt. These cases originated in towns spread across the Massachusetts and Plymouth colonies, with witch trials held in places like Boston, Plymouth, and York. These cases are fascinating, so let's get right to it. Do you want to kick things off, Sarah? Sure. We're primarily covering witchcraft accusations made between 1657 and 1683. But I want to point out that our first case actually overlaps with the timeline of the trials of Hugh and Mary Parsons of Springfield, which we covered in the previous edition of Massachusetts Witch Trials 101, but continues through the 1660s. Jane James of Marblehead sued accusers for slander in 1650 and again in 1651 and 1667 for being called a witch. On one occasion, she was accused by Peter Pitford of cursing his garden. Another accuser claimed she had appeared at sea in the shape of a cat. Fortunately for Jane, she was never tried for witchcraft. The next case involves my possible ancestor, William Brown of Gloucester, who in 1657 was accused of bewitching Margaret Prince, whose child had been stillborn. Brown was not convicted of witchcraft. Instead, he was convicted of diverse miscarriages and was ordered to spend one week in jail pay a 20 mark fine and pay Thomas Prince, husband of Margaret, unspecified costs. Next, we have the long and allegedly magical career of John Godfrey of Essex County. John was in court on witchcraft-related matters at least five times. John came to New England as a teen in the 1630s and frequently moved around Essex County. In March 1659, 11 people accused Godfrey of witchcraft. James Davis Sr., Jane and John Hazeltine, Abraham Whitaker, Ephraim Davis, Benjamin Sweat, Isabel Holdred, Job Tyler, Charles Brown, the Widow Ayers, and Goodman Proctor. Thomas Hain testified about a spectral horse that scared Isabel Holdridge. Nathan Gould testified about a spectral snake that scared Isabel. Isabel Holdridge herself testified about these shape-shifting animals. Goodwife and Charles Brown testified about John Godfrey talking about witches, saying they should be treated kindly or there could be consequences. Charles also reported he once saw a teat under John Godfrey's tongue. William Osgood testified that he once, back in 1640, accused Godfrey of making a deal with the devil and that Godfrey admitted it. On June 28, 1659, Godfrey won two pounds and 29 shillings in damages in a slander suit against William and Samuel Simons. Who happened to both be my ancestors. In a document dated March 25th, 1662, Thomas Chandler said that John Kerr had called Godfrey a witching rogue. In a document dated March 15th, 1663, Essex County Court ordered Jonathan Singletary to appear at the next court, which would be held in Ipswich, to answer charges that he slandered Godfrey by calling him a witch, saying, Is this witch on this side of Boston Gallows yet? John Remington and Edward Yeomans said that Jonathan Singletary had told them he'd been visited by spectral Godfrey while in jail. Singletary was ordered to make a public apology to Godfrey or pay 10 shillings. Jonathan Singletary testified that Godfrey indeed visited him in jail, and Singletary tried to hit Godfrey with a stone, but Godfrey vanished. On June 30th, 1663, the court found for the defendant in the Godfrey versus Singletary suit. Godfrey vowed to appeal. On March 29th, 1664, the court found for Godfrey and ordered Singletary to acknowledge wrongdoing or pay 10 shillings plus two pounds in court costs. In 1666, Job Tyler and John Remington complained about Godfrey. 
On February 22, 1666, the court summons witnesses to testify about Godfrey's witchcraft. Matthias Button, Sarah Button, Edward Yeomans, Goodwife Yeomans, Abraham Whitaker, Elizabeth Whitaker, Robert Swan, Elizabeth Swan, Abigail Remington, John Remington Jr., Joseph Johnson, Goodwife Holdridge, Ephraim Davis, William Simons, Samuel Simons, my ancestors, Mary Niece, Francis Dane, my ancestor, Nathan Parker. March 5th, 1666, Francis Dane wrote that he was unable to attend court due to infirmity and rough weather. Joe, Mary Sr., Moses, and Mary Jr., Tyler, testified that one time when Godfrey came over, a bird appeared with him and then disappeared. Job asked Godfrey about the bird, and Godfrey said, It came to suck your wife, meaning that Mary Tyler Sr. was a witch. Nathan Parker claimed that John Godfrey had said to Job Tyler that he could afford to blow on Tyler and not leave him worth a groat, a coin of little value. Joseph Johnson said that Godfrey said, If John Remington's son was a man as he was a boy, it had been worser for him. John Remington Jr. said that John Godfrey said to John Remington Sr., quote, If he drive the cattle up the woods to winter, then my father should say and have cause to repent that he did drive them up. That December, the young Remington was riding his horse when a mysterious crow appeared and harassed them. The horse fell. The bird pecked the dog. Remington got home but was laid up a while with an injured leg. Then Godfrey came over and argued with the boy and his mother. Abigail Remington repeated her son's testimony about what Godfrey said when he came over after the fall, saying Godfrey had bragged about unhorsing a boy the other day. Matthias Button corroborated the Remington's testimony as he had been there at the Remington house when Godfrey said those things he said. Godfrey was found suspicious but not legally guilty on March 6, 1666. John Godfrey passed away no later than 1675. Elizabeth Bailey of York, now in Maine, made the mistake of letting a rando minister named John Thorpe board in her house. Not only did he drink too much alcohol, he also used a ton of profanity, and Bailey wasn't having it. In fact, things got so bad that she ripped her boarder a new one, prompting him to move out. As far as Elizabeth was concerned, that settled that. Unfortunately, Thorpe was a bitter man who couldn't let things go. In an apparent act of retaliation, he accused Bailey of witchcraft, resulting in her trial by the county court. She must have been ecstatic when the verdict of not guilty was read. At the same court that tried Elizabeth Bailey, the minister, John Thorpe, was tried for abusive speech to a social superior, excessive drinking, scandalizing two ministers by saying they preached unsound doctrine, and for actually being the one preaching the unsound doctrine himself. He was convicted of all charges and ordered to pay fees. In June 1659, Winifred Holman of Cambridge and her daughter Mary were accused of witchcraft by Rebecca Gibson Stearns, who had an affliction not unlike those suffered 33 years later in Salem. The Holmans were arrested. The Holmans were both indicted. Mary probably was tried and acquitted. Winifred may not have been tried at all. And the Holmans sued John Gibson and Rebecca Stearns for defamation and slander in March 1660. Gibson had to pay a fine and apologize. Rebecca Stearns was let off the hook because she was in an irrational state of mind when she made her accusations. Which is interesting because if an accused person was in an irrational state of mind, the accusations had weight. Yes, that's a good point, sir. Next up, we have a rare case from Plymouth Colony. In 1661, William Holmes of Marshfield sued his neighbor, Dinah Sylvester, for defaming his wife by publicly calling her a witch. In court, Sylvester claimed she had seen Goodwife Holmes in the shape of a bear. The court did not find sufficient evidence that Holmes had contracted with Satan, so they sided with the plaintiff and ruled Sylvester guilty of defamation. She was sentenced to sign an admission of guilt. In 1665, Goodwife Gleason of Cambridge was presented on witchcraft charges. Not much else is known about this case. 
Edith Crawford, a resident of Salem, found herself embroiled in controversy when she was accused of employing witchcraft to burn a house from which she had been recently evicted due to a court decision. In a bold move to confront these allegations, Crawford took legal action in 1667, suing the individual who had leveled the accusations against her, the new homeowner of the property in question. Susanna North Martin is a well-known victim of the Salem Witch Trials. A stretch of highway going through Amesbury commemorates her. She is less known for her 1669 witchcraft trial, which marked the beginning of a long career of notoriety as a witch. Born in 1625 to Richard North, Susanna lost her mother when she was a young girl. She migrated to New England with her father, stepmother, and two sisters in about 1639, when Richard North was one of the initial proprietors of Salisbury, Massachusetts. In 1646, Susanna married recently widowed George Martin, and the couple had nine children. In April 1669, her husband George Martin posted a hundred pounds bond to keep Susanna out of jail while she awaited trial for witchcraft. The same day, George Martin filed a defamation suit against William Sargent for slandering Susanna. At her first witchcraft trial, Susanna was accused of having her first son out of wedlock and attempting to kill him, and of having another son who wasn't human, but actually an imp. The court did convict William Sargent of slander for accusing Susanna of infanticide and fornication. However, the jury did not convict him for slandering Susanna as a witch, and he was fined a mere eighth of a penny. Records of Susanna's first trial do not survive, but she is presumably acquitted as she was soon at liberty again. Also in 1669, Robert Williams of Hadley was acquitted of witchcraft, but convicted instead of lying. Another witchcraft accusation in 1669 was when Goodman Cross and Bradbrook said that Thomas Wells said he could set spells and raise the devil. He offered himself to be an artist. No formal charges filed. Wells denied the accusation. In 1671, an unknown woman of Groton was accused of witchcraft by Elizabeth Knapp, a supposedly possessed young woman serving in the household of minister Samuel Willard, who later earned fame for opposing the Salem witch trials. Willard did not trust the devilish voice coming from young Elizabeth, so he kept secret the name of the woman Elizabeth accused of bewitching her. Then, in 1673, Anna Edmonds of Lynn was known as a doctor woman and was presented on charges of witchcraft. Next, we have the sole Plymouth Colony witchcraft trial, that of Mary Ingham of Situate. Euler listeners may remember this case from our February 9th, 2023 episode titled Between God and Satan with Beth Caruso and Catherine Hermes. Unfortunately, not much is available on this case. We've previously covered the case of Alice Young, New England's first witch trial victim hanged in 1647. 30 years later, her daughter, Alice Jr., was accused of witchcraft in Springfield, Massachusetts in 1677. Her son sued the accuser for slander. In an intriguing case in 1679 and 1680, my 10th great granddad, Elizabeth Morse of Newbury, found herself accused of witchcraft following a series of poltergeist-like events in her home. The trouble began sometime after William and Elizabeth Morse took in their grandson, John Stiles. Much of the story will be familiar if you've listened to our episode on the devil of Great Island. First, William Morse said sticks and stones were thrown at its house. The Morses went outside to look and saw nobody, yet stones were still hurled at them, and they retreated inside and locked the door. Later that night, a hog appeared in the house, despite the door being locked. The next day, some things hanging in the chimney crashed down into the fire, and an awl disappeared only to come down the chimney. William put the awl away in a cupboard and closed the door, but the awl kept coming down the chimney again and again three or four times. Then the same thing happened with the basket. Things just continued to disappear and then come down the chimney. Another hog appeared in the locked house. More sticks and stones. The pots hung over the fire, danced and clinged against each other and had to be taken down. William's rope making tools 
kept disappearing. And the bedclothes flew off while Elizabeth was making the bed. Caleb Powell, a seaman, visited often, and he said he would take the boy for a time and see what happened. He took the boy for a day, and nothing happened while the boy was away. William Morse gave in a statement on December 3rd, 1679. Thomas Rogers and George Hardy corroborated some of William Morse's testimony. John Richardson said a board flew against his chair. William Morse's brother and my ancestor, Anthony Morse, said he saw the board that hit Richardson while it was still tacked to the window. John Dole said a pin, a stick, a stone, and a firebrand fell down beside him. John Tucker said that while these things were falling by John Dole, John Stiles was in a corner and didn't move. Elizabeth Titcombe said Caleb Powell said if he had another scholar with him, he could find whoever was bewitching the Morse house. Stephen Greenleaf and Edward Richardson affirmed seeing the strange motion. John Tucker said Caleb Powell said John Stiles threw a shoe. John Emerson said Caleb Powell had boasted about being trained in the black art by someone named Norwood. William Morse also testified to a number of strange events on December 8, 1679. Bread turned over and struck him. A chair bowed to him several times. The door closed itself. An iron wedge and a spade flew out of the chamber at Elizabeth without hitting her. A drum rolled over. The cellar door flew shut. Barn doors unpinned themselves and the pin fell out of the sky. Caleb Powell told the Morses that John Stiles had done the mysterious things around the house. Powell claimed skill in astrology, astronomy, and the working of spirits. The Morses loaned John Stiles to Powell, and nothing happened for a time. When John Stiles returned to the home, a great noise was heard in the other room, but nothing was seen there. And William Morse's cap almost came off his head. There was a hit to William's head. His chair was pulled back as if to topple him. And a cat was thrown at his wife, Elizabeth. The cat was thrown about several times. Once the poor cat was thrown on the bed, wrapped in a red waistcoat. The lamp tipped over and all the oil spilled out. Another great noise for a great while, described as being very dreadful. And a stone moved on its own. Two spoons flew off the table and the table was knocked over. The ink horn was hidden and the pen was taken. William Morse's spectacles were thrown from the table. And his account book thrown into the fire. Boards came off a tub and stood upright. John Badger said he was at Morse's house when Caleb Powell said he knew astrology and astronomy and could determine whether the diabolical means were used against the Morse's. Mary Tucker and Mary Richardson said Caleb Powell said he spied through the Morse's window and saw the boy play tricks. Anthony Morse, brother of William Morse. And Anthony being my ancestor and William my uncle. Witnessed a brick disappear from his hands and fly down the chimney. Also a hammer came down the chimney and a piece of wood and a firebrand, which happened around November 28th. This testimony was dated December 8th in 1679 by John Woodridge, the commissioner. William Morse complained of Caleb Powell for working with the devil to disturb the Morses. Caleb Powell appeared before John Woodridge on December 8th, and the magistrate agreed William Morse could prosecute the case at Ipswich County Court on the last Tuesday of March. Sarah Hall and Joseph Merrick testified that John Moores, boatswain of the vessel where Caleb Powell was a mate, said that If there were any wizards, he was sure that Caleb Powell was a wizard. This testimony was dated February 27, 1680. The court dismissed the case, but declared Powell suspicious and ordered him to pay court costs. Israel Webster said John Stiles said that he, John Stiles, was going to hell and could not read on Sundays because the devil didn't let him. Thomas Titcomb said John Stiles, quote, used many foul words on Sabbath day. And when asked if he was going to meeting, he said he was going to hell. Yeah, this is so familiar with other afflicted children's stories. 
when they're asked to do work, suddenly they're afflicted and can't do it, or they're they're held back by a witch or a devil and they can't do the things they're supposed to do, but they can do, strangely enough, the things that they want to do. Elizabeth Titcomb said there was a mysterious knocking at her door while she was sleeping. It knocked three times, but nobody responded when Elizabeth asked who was there. Lydia and Peniel Titcomb agreed. Jonathan Woodman said seven years ago he was going home when he saw a white cat, which did play at my legs. As he had no weapon, he only kicked the cat, which cried out and disappeared. He later learned that the Morrises had called for a doctor that same night to tend to Elizabeth's head. Benjamin Richardson testified about something weird happening at Morse's house. David Wheeler talked about a heifer that came home with a chewed up back twice and got sick and started behaving strangely. Joshua Richardson said he tried to stash his sheep in Morse's cow house one time when he was out working on getting the sheep across the river, but Elizabeth Morse chewed him out and he left. When he arrived at his destination, the sheep were all sick and foaming at the mouth. Caleb Moody testified that he lost several livestock in an unusual manner over the 20 years he lived near the Morses. And William Fanning described being attacked by a great white cat without a tail. Maybe just a lynx? John Mithill testified that a calf's skin fell off replaced by something red, like a burn before the animal's eyes bulged out of his head. A cow pooped out of its sight, and other animals met ill fates. Robert Earle said that he visited Elizabeth Morse and heard a strange sucking sound, like a whelp feeding. On March 6, 1680, the court ordered Constable Joseph Pike of Newbury to apprehend Elizabeth Morse and take her to the jail in Ipswich. Esther Wilson testified that when her mother, Goodwife Chandler, was sick, she complained about Elizabeth Morse being a witch and mailed a horseshoe to the door to prevent witches from getting in. Morse would not come in while the horseshoe was on. Instead, she'd kneel by the door and talk with them from outside. William Moody came to the house of Goodwife Chandler and knocked the horseshoe off the door. Then Elizabeth Morse would come in until the horseshoe was nailed back up. Later, Moody knocked it off and took it away. Once again, Morse would enter the home. Goodwife Chandler began having visions of Elizabeth Morse and then experiencing fits. This testimony was dated May 17, 1680 and read in court on May 20th. Elizabeth Titcomb said Susanna Tappan said Elizabeth Morse seized her by the wrist at the court to ask what evidence Susanna would give in. That night, Susanna felt a cold, damp hand grab her wrist. She then became ill, feeling itchiness and pricking throughout her body, her skin dry and scaly. Since then, she has not been out of her house. And Elizabeth Titcomb said she told Goodwife Morse about the evidence against her, and Morse was greatly affected and fell on weeping and said she was as innocent as herself or the child newborn or as God in heaven. Lydia Titcomb claimed she and her siblings saw an owl turn into a cat, then a dog. This mystery animal was sometimes completely black. At other times, it had a white ring around its neck. Sometimes it had long ears. At other times, it had virtually no ears at all. Sometimes it had an extremely long tail. At other times, it had virtually no tail at all. This sounds like a riddle. The beast accompanied them home, scaring their socks off. Susan Tappan did testify and said that Morse did indeed grab her by the wrist, but not in court. It was actually after a public meeting on a Sabbath day. Thomas Knowlton said that when he was escorting her to jail, Elizabeth Morris said that she was as clear of the accusation as God in heaven. John Chase, another possible relative of mine, said the day Caleb Powell had come to hear his testimony against Elizabeth Morris, he, John Chase, was taken with the bloody flux, which lingered until he spoke against Morris in court. Also, his wife had sore breasts that she had lost them both and one of them rotted away from her. Jane Sewell said that William Morris told her a story about his wife not being called for at first when Thomas Wells' wife was in labor. Due to some hesitancy by Thomas' sister, the woman suffered a long labor until finally Morris was sent for. 
at which point the baby came. John March said that sometime around 1674, he was awakened by several cats and rats at play together. He flung several things at them but could not strike them. The next morning, he heard goodwife Wells called Elizabeth Morse a witch to her face. After Elizabeth left, goodwife Wells told John March that Elizabeth had told her about the cats and rats, and goodwife Wells wondered how Elizabeth could know they'd seen them, since nobody who saw them had left the house yet that morning. According to John March, goodwife Wells told him she'd often seen small creatures like mice or rats under Elizabeth Morse's coat. Daniel Thurston and Richard Woolsworth affirmed that they had also heard Goodwife Wells say such things. James Brown, another Josh ancestor, testified that Elizabeth Morse said George Wheeler's vessel would not return from its voyage and that she told him in the morning of his misdemeanors the previous night. He asked her how she knew what he had done, and she said everyone knew. She replied that everyone knew she was a witch. She said... Our Savior Christ was belied, and so is you and I. David Wheeler testified that he had seen Elizabeth Morse, his next-door neighbor, do many strange things. And once, he was supposed to do an errand for her and neglected to do it for several days while he was busy hunting geese. He was unsuccessful at getting a bird. Then, Elizabeth Morse told him he wouldn't get any geese until after he finally performed the task. At last, he did what he had agreed to do, and then... He was immediately successful hunting geese. Margaret Merrick claimed that she had once concealed a private letter, and yet Elizabeth Morse came a few days later and recited everything in the letter, though she'd most likely never seen it as it was in hiding. A cat belonging to Zachariah Davis mysteriously danced and roared after Zachariah failed to bring Elizabeth Morse some wings. Gotta bring those wings, man. Elizabeth was tried in May 1680. And indicted on May 20th. On May 22nd, Secretary Edward Rawson wrote that the court decided it was okay to admit the testimony of a single witness to a single event. If at least one other witness brought in similar testimony about another event, only they witnessed. Governor Simon Bradstreet pronounced the death sentence for Elizabeth on May 27th. However, the governor and assistants reprieved her on June 1st. On June 4th, her husband, William, petitioned for better treatment for her in jail, such as liberty to walk the yard during the day and to sleep in the common jail rather than the dungeon. On November 3rd, the deputies protested the court's decision not to execute Elizabeth. According to John Hale, the governor and magistrates rejected the death sentence because they determined that seeing a specter of Elizabeth was not the same as actually seeing Elizabeth perform witchcraft. They also determined that multiple witnesses to the same event were indeed necessary to admit the testimony as evidence. In 1681, William wrote to the general court on May 14th and again on May 18th, contesting the testimony against his wife and pleading her innocent. And we are writing to the same general court today asking for these accused witches to receive an apology from the state. William Morse won the release of Elizabeth into his custody, and she was placed under a sort of house arrest. In 1679, an unknown woman from Northampton, Massachusetts, was accused of witchcraft. Unfortunately, no other details are available in this case. Moving forward, we get to the 1680 case of Margaret Gifford of Lynn who frequently appeared in court as attorney for her husband and was accused of witchcraft in 1680. Her so-called unwomanly behavior in acting as attorney may have drawn suspicion. Our next witchcraft suspect in 1680 is Bridget Oliver, better known as Bridget Bishop, the first execution victim of the Salem Witch Trials in 1692. But that wasn't her first run-in with the law on suspicion of witchcraft. In 1680, she was acquitted of witchcraft a year after her husband, Thomas Oliver, died. We will have much more on Bridget in our upcoming Salem Witch Hunt 101 series. In the 1987 book, The Devil in the Shape of a Woman, author Carol Carlson suggests that the Mary Hale, who was accused of bewitching Mariner Michael Smith to death, could be the mother of Winifred Benham of Wallingford, Connecticut, who was accused of witchcraft multiple times in the 1690s. 
In 2007, authors Michael J. LeClerc and Dee Bretton Simmons used the most reliable sources to connect Mary Hill to brothers and also to Winifred Benham in their article, The American Genealogist Publication, Origin of Accused Witch Mary, Williams King, Hale of Boston and her brothers Hugh, John, and possibly Nathaniel Williams. The article establishes Mary's life since 1654 in Boston, highlighting her family ties and property dealings, and suggests she was married twice, with her first husband's surname possibly being King or Ling, and her second husband's surname being Hale, established her connection to the Williams family with roots in London and Surrey, England. Despite the serious witchcraft accusations in 1680 and 81, Mary was acquitted. Her family, particularly her brothers Hugh and John Williams, were prominent figures in Boston and Block Island. Her husbands have not been identified. The 1674 Boston tax list records her name as Widow Hale. Only one of her children has been identified, Winifred, but she is recognized as having multiple children. She faced witchcraft accusations in February and March of 1680. Michael had lodged at her home and had quartered the granddaughter, Joanna. Mary was accused of supernaturally transporting him to a witch's Sabbath in Dorchester. During the trial, a form of evidence for witchcraft was presented, centering around a test with a bottle containing Michael Smith's urine. Observers noted that when the bottle was sealed, Mary began to pace restlessly exhibiting an agitated behavior within her dwelling. Conversely, when the bottle was opened, her restless movement ceased entirely. This correlation between Mary's actions and the state of the bottle was deemed to be indicative of witchcraft. Accuser Margaret Ellis wanted to see Mary burn, which was never done to a witch in New England, but Mary was acquitted, and then no more is heard of her. Mary Hill is my 10th great-grandmother. An unknown woman of Kittery was accused of witchcraft in 1682. Unfortunately, no further details are available for this case. Mary Webster, wife of William Webster, was examined at county court on March 27, 1683, and the case was referred to the Court of Assistance in Boston. Mary was indicted May 22, 1683 and acquitted June 1, 1683. According to witness testimony, she served the devil in the form of a black cat and suckled imps from teats in her secret parts. According to Cotton Mather, Philip Smith was a saintly man who died at the hands of Mary Webster. Smith became unduly anxious about his health and had ischiatic pain in the lowest three bones of his pelvis. Smith became delirious and loudly ranted in multiple languages, or so it was thought, suffered sore pain, from sharp pins pricking him. He claimed to see Mary Webster and some others afflicting him. He smelled a strange musky scent. Some of his attendants went and harassed poor Mary Webster, and he was well while they were at it. A container of medicine emptied without spilling. People heard a strange scratching sound. There was a mysterious fire on the bed from time to time. It would quickly vanish Something strange seemed to move in the bed, away from Smith's body. The night after he died, the bed moved on its own. Two nights after he died, mysterious sounds like furniture being moved in the room where the corpse lay were heard. And strange signs of life in the body after Smith had presumably died. According to lore, Mary Webster was brutally beaten in 1684 by a mob of zealous skew. According to Thomas Hutchinson, who wrote much later, the people who went to harass Webster actually, having dragged her out of her house, they hung her up until she was near dead, let her down, rolled her sometime in the snow, and at last buried her in it, and there left her. In 1685, Mary Webster sued for slander. The James Fuller case from Springfield is particularly interesting. Fuller was accused of seeking the devil's aid, a familiar charge. Fuller's change of response to the accusations is especially notable. He initially admitted to the claims, but then retracted, stating he had belied himself. This turn of events adds significant complexity, highlighting the challenges in discerning guilt or innocence in these trials. Fuller's case exemplifies the judicial severity of the period. 
despite his retraction and claim of lying, the court sentenced him to whipping for wicked and pernicious willful lying. Such harsh punitive measures were common and reflect the Puritans' strict approach to law and order. The harsh sentence underscored the need for control and punishment of behaviors deemed deviant. Cases such as Fuller's were instrumental in perpetuating the fear of witchcraft. Understanding these cases is crucial for comprehending the complexities and fears of early American society. It's also telling that he, a man, was let off of the witchcraft charge and only punished for lying. We have seen this several times with men, but never with women. It came up a few times in this episode. Must be a thing. The period of 1657 to 1687 saw no executions for witchcraft in Massachusetts, and only one known conviction, that of Elizabeth Morse, who was placed under house arrest instead of being hanged. In the next episode of Massachusetts Witch Trials 101, we will examine the 1688 case of Goody Glover of Boston and what may have led the judges to condemn her after more than 30 years without an execution. And stay tuned after that episode for the beginning of our Salem Witch Hunt 101 series. And now for a minute with Mary. You may recall from last week's Minute with Mary that female Gleason was indicted on the capital crime of witchcraft at Cambridge, Middlesex County, Massachusetts, British America. This week, the Massachusetts Witch Hunt Justice Project is closing in on her identity. Project member and genealogist David Allen Lambert provided the team with marriage documentation for two women who married into the Gleason family. These two women were alive and living in the area in the mid-1660s. I found evidence that a third woman married into the Gleason family, but her vital dates are unknown. Dr. Tricia Pion, another project member and researcher, provided a resource regarding the First Church of Cambridge records dating to the early 1660s. Diving into the list of members to locate the Gleason family has begun. We've also reached out to Beth Folsom of Cambridge History to help us locate Middlesex County court records for a possible court record regarding females' indictment. Stay tuned. We are close to identifying female Gleason's given name. Thank you, Mary. Here's Sarah with End Witch Hunts News. End Witch Hunts, a nonprofit 501c3 organization. Weekly news update. Remember, each case of sorcery accusation or witch hunt represents real individuals, each with their own names, families, dreams, and aspirations for peace. It's vital to actively oppose the targeting of vulnerable members within our communities. Education and advocacy are key to ending witch hunts. This entails transforming perceptions regarding the equal worth of every individual, insisting on a moral code that upholds human dignity, in challenging mob behaviors through the enforcement of laws in place to protect victims. If you hold a position of influence, whether in your community, on social media, in educational settings, or within the government, it's your opportunity to advocate and to stand up for the vulnerable. Speak out, raise awareness, and help strengthen organizations fighting these harmful practices. End Witch Hunts firmly advocates for universal human dignity, echoing the United Nations Charter's commitment to human rights, equality, and dignity. We condemn harmful practices related to witchcraft accusations and ritual attacks as grave violations against human dignity. We urge states and individuals alike to defend and uphold human dignity, protecting everyone from torture, mistreatment, and discrimination. You can join us by amplifying the stories of victims of witch hunts, past and present. Engage with advocacy groups, learn through our resources, and voice your concerns to authorities. Your involvement, whether by sharing our content, discussing these issues in your network, or urging leaders to act, is invaluable. Together, we can nurture values of compassion, understanding, and justice in our world. Support our mission by becoming a financial donor. Visit witchhuntsshow.com to donate any amount you're comfortable with. Your generosity is the backbone of the podcast content you value. Let's commit to making a difference together. Thank you, Sarah. You're welcome. And thank you for listening to Witch Hunt. Join us next week when we learn about the witch trials of several New Hampshire residents. Visit witchhuntshow.com and sign up for our newsletter, Witch Hunt Wednesday. 
Support our efforts to end witch hunts. Visit endwitchhunts.org to learn more. Have a great today and a beautiful tomorrow.